much of time between series, between series, and I really uh, am looking, I've been looking forward to taking the opportunity to just speak to a couple of things that the Lord's been putting on my heart lately. They're not necessarily to be stretched out in a series, although I think after you hear today's content, it certainly could be longer than one week, but you know, I do believe that the Lord will speak to us when we have ears to hear. If we're going to be willing to listen, God's going to talk to us. Have you experienced that? Yeah? Uh, well, you know, the thing is, we live in a day and an age where there are a lot of pieces of information, a lot of stories, a lot of narratives, a lot of spin that gets put on a lot of details that cause us to really be overloaded, overloaded, inundated, and overwhelmed with information. And it's difficult at times to discern what is true from what's a lie. And, you know, unfortunately, even as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, we fall prey to deception. We fall prey and we become victims of lies, things that we hold to be true in our own hearts and lives, maybe even in the way that we see God or the, the, his people or others around us, that we see that and we say, well, that must be true because that's what I've been told. That's what I've observed. And we neglect to investigate and to look to the truth. And I want to just talk to, I know there are so many ways in which we have been deceived that God brings us to a place of light and truth. But how many of us desire to walk in complete truth? You just want to be, you want to live and walk and speak and raise your family and walk your life out in the light and not have anything to do with darkness, to when lies come our way, to be able to identify them and reject them, to be able to walk and embrace what is true and abandon and run from what is false. I mean, this is the heartbeat of all of God's people, right? You know, get rid of those lies. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's okay. Let's get, some of you are, uh, it was referenced earlier, you might be, this is not your normal service of attendance, but because there's a football game at 10 o'clock, by the way, this service won't be done quite by 10 o'clock, so hate to disappoint you or to appoint you, but that's the, that's the first lie that we're going to address. No, I'm kidding. That's not it. But uh, you need to get warmed up. If you're going to be cheering later this afternoon, you need to get warmed up, and you don't want to pull a muscle later today. So get a little bit interactive this morning, because we want to talk about some of the lies that I believe uh, that the enemy has, has pulled over on God's people, things that we embrace or accept because they get pushed so hard, so loud, so often from the culture around us. And I think it's easy, if we just coast through life, if we just accept what is said, if we observe and we listen and we say, well, that must be true, and we never investigate, we never look, we never apply the truth of God to situations, we will find ourselves far from where we need to be. And I want to be exactly where I need to be. By the way, before we jump into the first of these lies and truth that God applies to it, I want to give you a heads up. Uh, the new year is on its way quickly. The year 2020 is an important year, uh, I believe, for this church, but more, more, more so also for each of us as individuals, as families, as, as, as the places in our lives. I believe that God is stepping uh, us into a new year. And I want to encourage you this. Even through this busy time of the holidays, would you pray and ask God to give you personal clarity on the season that's ahead? Would you pray and ask God to give you personal clarity? If you have a degree of leadership in your family, in your place of work, in your school, wherever it might be, would you ask God to give you clarity about the, the plans and the vision that he has for the year ahead? Uh, at the end of the year, right as we, as we step into 2020, we're going to have a service designed to really uh, focus our hearts and just pray and ask the Lord and write down what the Lord leads us and guides us into. But I don't think we just want to step into it and go, okay, God, that's tomorrow. When do we want to think about that? I want to ask you to be praying and thinking and maybe even fasting and asking the Lord for clarity. Uh, because I believe this, the days ahead of us are the most important days that we will ever receive. Every day behind us is gone. And they've been important and significant, but nothing, nothing compares to the moments that lie in front of us. And I believe that God has a plan for it. Do you? And I want to walk in God's plan. Do you? Come on, it's a good thing. So uh, we want to be people of truth. We want to be people of truth. Uh, how many of you have heard some lies this week? Anybody hear any lies this week? 
you know? Uh, how many of you have maybe even been tempted to believe some of those lies because they've been so convincing? I mean, there are such clever ways of telling lies that, uh, that, that there are things that we just go, wow, that actually sounds true. I, I mean, I know it's not, but there's something about that that might even make me think that that's the right thing. And I believe this, that we live in a world where the, the motto is not speak the truth at all costs. The motto is speak something that people will believe and, and then eventually it'll become the truth. That if you repeat a lie over and over and over again, people will become so accustomed to hearing it that they'll think that that's what's right. They'll think that that's what's true. And that comes from all places of influence. That comes not just, I'm not just talking about some deep state media conspiracy against all of these things. Yes, some of that might be true, but here's what I'm also saying. That happens in our own hearts and lives. That if we're not careful, if we don't keep ourselves walking along the plumb line of truth that comes to us through God's word, we will find ourselves telling lies to ourselves about things that we think are okay or are right or are good to a place where we become so inoculated that we cannot discern the truth from the lies. And that's not a good place to be. Because when trouble comes, you wanna know which direction to run. And if you're not sure which way is up, which way is north, which way is home, you really just don't wanna be running full speed in any direction, right? That's a bad, bad plan. Uh, John chapter eight, and I wanna ask you, we're gonna read two verses out loud and together. Would you stand with me? Jesus was in a conversation and guiding people's hearts and minds towards truth in John chapter eight. And he spoke these words, which I believe are fitting and right for us to consider today. And would you read them out loud with me today and let your voice be empowered by faith to speak the truth of God's word today. Here we go. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus, thank you for your strong words. Thank you for your words of truth. We receive them today. We believe in you today and we want to walk by faith in what you have just spoken over those who believe in you, that we would know the truth and that the truth would set us free. Let that be our portion today. We pray it in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Uh, be seated. Let me just address a couple of issues in this chapter, in this verse. You know, we, we read here that Jesus said to the people who believed in him, and here's a side note. The literal words that are used, it says that Jesus said to them that believed in him, those Jews that believed in him. He uses that word, literally. It says to the Jews that believed in Jesus. You know, we often find ourselves being accustomed to uh, kind of a macro view of things with, and we miss details. We often find ourselves saying things like, the Jews rejected Jesus and that's why he went to the, that's why Paul went to the Gentiles. That's why us Gentiles can be included in the kingdom. And you know what's true is in many ways there, there were many of the Jewish people of Jesus' day that did not embrace the truth of God that Jesus brought them. They rejected Jesus. But I want you to know that all, all, every one of the first disciples were Jewish. All of the first generation of the church were Jews who embraced the truth of Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah of all who would believe. And so let's not fi find ourselves slipping into this false narrative where, you know, there's like the Jews and they're the bad guys. That is such a, a misapplication of the words of Scripture. Jesus is Jewish. Jesus, as he walked this planet, walked this planet in the form of a Jewish man. The disciples were Jewish people. The mother of Jesus was a Jewish godly woman. I mean, so we, when we look at this, let's apply the right words and the right truth here. The Jews who believed in Jesus, which the operative word, yes, the Jewish part is important, but what's most important in this context is those who believed in Jesus. Those who believed in him as the Messiah, as the chosen one of God. And so you're saying, well, I'm not Jewish today. What does that have to do with me? It has everything to do with you. Because you also are presented with an opportunity to believe in Jesus. That is what makes us truly children of God. That is what makes us truly children of God. But it says here, of those Jewish people who believed in him, Jesus said to them, you're truly my disciples 
when you remain faithful to my teachings, or Jesus said, when you remain in my word, in my word. And we've talked about this time and time and time again in the context of looking at truth and lies. It's important for us today to, re- to know that the source of truth in a world full of lies is rock solid. It is the word of God. Jesus himself, the living word of God, the source of truth. Jesus says, you really want to be a follower of me? You believe in me. If you want to be a disciple of me, follow me, walk with me, obey me, please me, do the work of my father. He says, remain faithful to my teachings. Remain faithful to my word. You know, you don't have to have a PhD in every topic of conversation that comes out today to discern and to know what the truth is. Friends, it's enough for us to be students of the word of God. And I don't mean as an academic exercise. I mean as a step of faith towards the real truth of this world. I mean, you have to work super hard to convince people against their will. And that's what a lot of people do here. They just, they will spin so hard, spin so hard to convince us of things that the Bible is pretty clear and black and white about that, you know, that's not really what we need to be concerned about. The Bible's not literal. The Bible's not true. You know, it's, it's not this and that. It's a metaphor. It's like, look, that is a, a complete just hack of what the Bible actually says. And so, you know, you, don't, you might feel today um, ill-equipped to combat or even identify some of the lies that come at us because they're very complicated. They're very sophisticated in terms of of education, in terms of scientific discovery, in terms of interpretation of scripture, in terms of current events and news and politics. I think, man, I can't keep all this stuff straight. I don't even know what's going on here. Am I just going to be a victim of the lies that come to me? Listen, stay close to the word of God. Stay close to the word of God. And can I just say this? Yeah, yeah, that's a true statement. And that's something that we need to identify with. Can I just say something here today? Um, there, there may be a few in this room. I'm just going out on a, it's not a word from the Lord. This is just a hunch that um, the number one text in your life, the number one reading, the number one source of information in your life uh, is a news outlet. Is maybe not a news outlet, but a news feed. And the most, the thing that you're interested in in the most to gain a perspective of the world and what's happening uh, comes to you in the form of reporting and information. And there's, I don't believe there's anything wrong with reporting and information. There are some wrong reporting and information. But what I'm here to say is, would you make an intentional, decisive effort to shift your taste of information Not to abandon the news. I'm not telling you to abandon the news unless the Lord calls you to do that. But I'm telling you to embrace the good news in a way that shapes and forms your vision of the world, that informs the way that you see current events. Would you be such, uh, so in love with the word of God, so enamored by the truth of God's word That even when you hear stories about current events or politics or science or medicine or technology, that you hear it through the lens of, what does God's word say about that? Right? Let me try this again. Because I heard a couple amens, and I know that some of you were just like, is this the time to say an amen? And I just want to affirm you, yes, it is. I'm just going to say, would you make an intentional effort? To be so close to God's word that when you hear the news of the world, the first thought in your mind is, what does God's word say about this? Amen? Amen. Come on, that's good. God is pleased when we we, uh, point our hearts in the direction of his word. Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will what? Doesn't that feel good? To be set free. To set free from sin, from deception, from lies, from all of the spin and the confusion and the sophisticated schemes and attempts of the world and all of its powers to deceive us, to hoodwink us into a place of fruitlessness as followers of Jesus Christ. That's not God's plan. God's plan is to empower us. God's plan is to send us out to bring transformational good news to the world around us. Uh, Know the truth. And be set free. Amen? 
Come on, let's talk about some truth today. Uh, I just want to bring up three lies, and I know this. This is my prayer. Uh, as I've been praying and thinking about it, there's just three lies that I believe I want to address with the word of God today, with the truth of God. But my prayer is this, is that this would serve as a spiritual springboard in every one of our lives to cause us to ask the questions, Lord, what other lies are there that attempt to deceive me? Lord, in what other way am I thinking falsely? Am I being informed wrongly about the truth? So we're going to talk about a few today, but I know this. God doesn't just speak through me. Amen? Are you glad for that? God speaks through you. God speaks through words, like through our friend Lisa this morning. God confirms and reminds us. God wakes us up in the middle of the night. God interrupts us in the course of deep thought. God speaks to us, whispers to us in the middle of a television show or a football game. And he says, hey, look, I got something that I want to say to you. And if we're listening, God will lead us. And my prayer is that God would expose all of the lies that come to us. And they come quick. And they come often. And God equips us with everything we need to battle them. First lie that I want to address today is this, that the battles of this world are the battle. And I know that sentence is in all caps, but if you could put the word the, the second word the there into all caps in your brain. And by this, let me qualify this statement here. The battles of this world are the battle. Things like this. And I'm going to list things that are important. So I'm in no way downgrading their significance or importance. But I'm going to say things that if we're not careful, we will think that these are what it's all about. Now listen, this is confusing. Things like abortion. We're God's people. We're passionate about life. And we believe and we will advocate and we will champion and we will fight and we will speak the truth of God about this issue. And it is vital and critical that people are not lied to and deceived to see that life is an inconvenience, that life is a choice, that life is anything other than what it is, the gift of God. But, but abortion, religious liberty, political choices, elections, impeachments, we, we're, we're even things like this, uh, arguments in our family, workplace conflict, ambition, career advancement. These are all great things. Education. All of these things are important and good with, with certain respects. I'm not saying that I think impeachment is important and good, but I think the conversation around it. Was that a political statement? I saw Pastor Joe on the video. By the way, Pastor Joe's preaching next Sunday, so maybe we'll get a little more political next Sunday. <laughs> Just kidding. Pastor Joe's never political. You guys ought to know better than that, but I'm excited about that. Uh, but we, listen, when we think about these battles, and, and, and in no uncertain terms, these are important battles. These are important issues for us to be attentive to, for us to be aware of, for us to be vigilant and diligent in working for justice, letting the kingdom of God, as it is in heaven, to be brought about here on the earth, in our families, in our workplaces, in our nation, in our courts, in every way that we have influence to garner it and yield it for the purposes of advancing true justice. But I'm just here to tell you right now, any of these issues, if we were to resolve them at a civic level, to resolve them at a legal level, to resolve them with an election, to resolve them, look, the battle continues. And sometimes we put all our eggs in the visible battle basket and we miss the bigger picture. You know, it's a classic strategy of warfare to, uh, to, to run some deceptive means towards the enemy. There's a story in the book of Joshua. I was just reading it this morning as I was thinking about this message, a story in the book of Joshua where they, uh, they, they come against the city of Ai. And uh, you know the story there if you, if you do, but I was just looking at it this morning. It's in Joshua chapter 8 where uh, they'd had some some hard time capturing the city, and then they dealt with some sin in the camp, and then they, they said, let's try this again. So they, they said, here's the strategy. We're gonna send one group uh, while it's still dark, and they're gonna sit on this side of the city. 
And then what we're gonna do in the morning when the sun comes up is we're gonna march out there and we're gonna pretend like we're afraid and running away from them. They're gonna empty the city thinking we've got them. And as they do, then our people that are in hiding, the ones that they didn't see, you're just gonna come in and win the actual city, take over the actual city. Now, this is just a strategy of warfare. It's not just warfare, it's in athletics, it's in politics, it's in so many areas of life that, that it's kind of the distraction over here so that the real thing can happen here. And what's true in our world is that uh, in both cases, the distraction battle and the real battle are both critical and important, but we need to be aware so that we don't commit everything to the, to the, what the scene and the visible battle, but that we are truly motivated and walking in the truth of the spirit of God's word. Look, we can get so bought in to things like elections, to things like our liberties, things like politics, things like uh, our relationships, things like uh, important uh, decisions of our day, social issues, that we think that this is what is the most important, and that winning these battles is the hope of the world. We think that if we could convince people that these things are the most important and to, to make laws around these things, to bolster justice around these things, that that is the hope of the world. Friends, we have inverted the victory here. Those things that, that convincing people and, and, and building a society where all can flourish and thrive on true justice is an outcome of the true hope of the world. And the true hope of the world is none other than our Messiah, Jesus Christ. There is no plan B for salvation. There is no other hope, true hope, capital H-O-P-E, of the world other than Jesus himself. Amen. Friends, let's not be distracted. Let's keep fighting the battles, but let's not abandon the war. Ephesians 6, I need, I need to review this verse with so many of you because I know it's, it's something that you've heard and, and listened to and maybe even taught yourself. But Ephesians 6, verses 10 and 12, 10 through 12, say this. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all of the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. When we think about this in the context of the battles that we face, it doesn't uh, knock down the things that we've just listed to think, well, those aren't important. What it does is it elevates so high above them the truth. And the truth is this, that we are engaged in a battle and our battle is not political. Our battle is not economic. Our battle is not social. Our battle is not legal. There are many smaller battles in all of these arenas that the people of God have always fought and will continue to faithfully fight in obedience to God's word, but the true battle that we fight, listen, is not against flesh and blood. When Paul writes this in, uh, to the church in Ephesus, when he says this, that we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, the word that he uses there is a word uh, that is used for physical combat that we would consider hand-to-hand, -hand, wrestling, wrestling, physically struggling against, in that, in that mental picture. He's saying, we're not physically wrestling against flesh and blood enemies, but we are in a wrestling match. We are in a close quarters wrestling match with spiritual foes, with evil enemies. And he goes around to list in multiple ways the, the types of enemy that we should be aware of why? Because God has called us to be strong in the Lord. To be empowered is the, the literal word that Paul uses. To be empowered in the Lord and in his strength and in his might. We can wear God's armor for this purpose so that we will be able to stand firm against all of the strategies, the schemes, the attempts of the enemy. Do you know this, that our enemy is, is a scheming foe? He's a scheming foe. In fact, he is so scheming in his, uh, in his strategies against God's people 
that he would even be content with God's people fighting important battles, fighting important battles at the neglect of the most important battle. That if he can distract us and and pull our hearts, and, and by the way, there's a difference in the way we fight. When you're fighting flesh and blood, you swing. You know, you, you, you tackle, you, you, you get involved, you get angry. You know, like sometimes you just can't get anything done unless you get good and angry. You get mad at somebody and that, from that place of, that's where your motivation comes. Friends, that's not the case when it comes to the spiritual battle that we are fighting against our enemy, the devil. What we see is the flesh and blood. We see people who have been deceived, who have embraced that deception. And, and the Bible reminds us, those aren't our enemies. And I just want to bring it from a place of politics and this big sphere of influence around us to like zoom it into your home. Can we just zoom this one into your home? Have you ever felt like you've got an enemy in your own home? Have you ever felt like you've got an enemy in your own mirror? <laughs> the Bible tells us this, that your enemy is not the flesh and blood. Here's what's missing from the equation among believers today that we get deceived by things like this. We're missing discernment. And discernment's not just knowing what's up. It's being able to see what's behind it. Discernment is this. It's being able to see why is this the way it is? Is there something bigger at work here? Being able to discern, the Bible talks about the gift of discernment as the discerning between different spirits. You know, you say, you know what? Is that the Holy Spirit of God in a believer that I'm seeing come out in this conversation? Or is there something else going on here? And I believe this, if you, if you can see yourself being deceived or being sucked in to a flesh and blood battle in your own home, in your own place of work, in places of relationship, you, my friend, I, we need to be praying and fasting and asking God for the spiritual gift of discernment, that we would be able to discern different spirits. How can you, uh, how can you fight an enemy that you can't see if you don't even acknowledge that they're in, engaged in the battle? You're like, no, 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 it's not the enemy. The enemy's not doing anything here. Uh, my wife's just wrong. <laughs> that was a joke. I, that, I'm talking, I mean, your wife. Your wife is just wrong. You know, we're like in these things and we're like, you know what? I don't want to hear about the spirit. I don't want to hear about what God, I don't want to hear about spiritual powers. This is just, I need to win this argument. I need to win this fight. I don't want, I'm in a, in, a, in a battle with my boss. I'm in a battle with somebody at work. I'm in a battle with a friend at school. And I just, you know what? I don't want to consider the spiritual reality here. I just want to be right. And this is what the Bible is saying. Don't be deceived to think that being right is going to give hope to anybody. Winning these battles, yes, may be important, but as a secondary importance to what is really true is really true. You know, the word that he says, we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers, evil rulers. The word that's used for evil rulers is the word arxis, and it literally means this. It means, in some cases, it can be translated as the origins or the beginning. So it's the word, for instance, that Jesus used when he says, it was not that way in the beginning. It's not what God intended in the beginning. So God created a prototype, a beginning, and from that should flow everything else. But it's also used in the sense of an authority or a ruler or a king from which which all of the other influences flow. So in other words, what we're talking about here is our enemy, our enemy is probably a couple of layers deep. Our enemy is probably a couple, it's not the people that are in front of you or the people that are in front of them. It's what's behind it. It's what, where is that anger flowing from? Where is that hatred coming from? If you encounter people with so much hatred for the people of God, with so much hatred and disdain for ideological views that are different among people, you ask yourself this question, Where is that hatred coming from? What is the the beginning, the genesis, the origin of this hate? Is it just disagreement between family members? Is it just disagreement between friends? Or is the enemy of our soul attempting to sow a little bit of discord to a place where people will believe it and it will destroy relationships? Friends, what's the genesis of it? 
And we need to become investigative reporters. We need to become Sherlock Holmes of a spiritual sense, not just to accept things for what we see, but to say, what's really going on? You know, it can get a little bit spooky. And I know sometimes people in particular, maybe in beginning phases of walking in their faith with Christ, when we talk about like spiritual powers of darkness and wickedness in high heavenly places, that's spooky stuff. You're like, wow, this is, this, like, if that's who our battle is, it's way worse than I thought. I would way rather be fighting with my family. I would way rather be fighting, polit- if you start thinking about that type of a foe, an unseen enemy who is an expert at deception, who can convince uh, people that, are, that are, are walking in the right direction that they should go a different way, who can influence even those who belong to God to be involved in, in sowing hatred in their hearts. Like, Whoa, that's a spooky enemy. How do you win that kind of a battle? And so it brings us really to a second lie. Because while we see, maybe, begin to see clearly where the real battles are, our hearts can grow a little bit faint when we look at the daunting nature of our enemy. And we'll believe things like this, like the devil runs this place. The devil's in charge of this place. Wow, if that's our enemy, I I don't stand a chance. Things are just gonna keep getting worse and worse and worse, you could just keep adding worses and worses on the end of that statement. You know, this is the spirit of discouragement that the enemy brings over God's people. And Christians, we're not immune to it. Yeah, we come to church and we sing songs about hope and faith and life, and we're like, yes, go Jesus, and all this kind of thing, and then, you know, we walk out and we take a look at the world, and we're like, oh, pfft. yeah, that was only true then, and now the devil's in charge. Monday, is like Sunday, the Lord's day. I love the Lord's day, then Monday, it's the devil's day. Just saying right there. You know, that's, that's, these are the lies. And I'm being a little bit facetious here, but in, in many ways, this discouraging spirit, when we hear of some of the atrocities that go on, we just think, you know what? There's no hope for this world. There's no hope. Who's ever gonna turn this thing around? We read about what's happening in our country, the divisions that are so deep. At a, we see it at an ideological level. We see it at a political level. And you ask yourself the question, How can we ever come together and be a nation again? Where is the hope that's gonna, and and we start to get sucked into this black hole of hopelessness. Friends, this is the lie of the enemy. For Jesus is the hope of the politically divided as well. Jesus is the hope of the passionate sinner who is running 100 miles an hour, 180 degrees in the wrong direction. Jesus is the hope of the deceived. Jesus is the hope of the broken. Jesus is the hope of the faithful. Jesus is the hope. And the devil isn't in charge of anything. Yes, he has influence. Yes, he's a scary foe. But friends, look at this, Psalm 24. I love this verse, and it's something that we all need to commit to memory and certainly awareness. This is what Psalm 24 says. It says, the earth is whose? And everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundations on the seas, and he built it on the ocean depths. This place belongs to him because he made this place. God. You know, we say, well, how come it looks like the devil's in charge? Because the devil's a liar, a deceiver. He has been from the beginning, and he attempts to deceive, and oftentimes we willingly give him the power to deceive us because we step away from the truth of God's word. All we need to do is remind ourselves, you know, the earth is the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's. That's true. That's been true from the day that it was written. It was true before the day it was written. That's the truth. Do you ever notice how many times uh, the lies will change, but the truth never does? Lives will change every news cycle. Lies will change every time you ask somebody to explain it one more time to you. Lies will change every time they need to try to convince you of something different, but the truth never changes. Here's the truth. The earth is the Lord's. Are things getting crazy out there? Yeah. But is that the way it's going to continue all the way? I know you go, well, what about Revelation? I've read Revelation. That looks really, really bad there. It looks really, really bad because it describes people who abandon the Lord. But have you read all of Revelation? It's really, really awesome. 
like to worship around the throne of God. And, and, and people from every nation and every tribe and every tongue before the throne, just casting down their crowns around the throne, worshiping the Lord, speaking of his holiness, giving their honor and their grace to the Lord Jesus Christ, worshiping him face to face. We see Jesus righting all wrongs, healing all sicknesses, wiping away all tears. That's awesome. That's the way it ends. That's the way it goes. Friends, if that's what worse and worse and worse looks like to you, we need to go back to grammar school. That's good. That's better and better. You say, well, what about all the other stuff in there? It is a warning. It is a warning and it is an advance notice that when things get out of control, God is still in control. And I'm not here to convince you, like, you know what? Nothing bad is ever going to happen in your life. That's a lie as well. We're not addressing that one today, but bad stuff's probably going to happen in your life. Probably some uncomfortable things are going to happen in the next 24 hours even. And the Bible is telling us through the warnings that are extreme, even in the book of Revelation, that these things have no bearing on God's love for his people, on God's ability to contain and keep the world his own. Do not believe the enemy when he tells you, this is my place. Jesus didn't believe him. When the, remember when Jesus was tempted? The devil said, hey, just bow down and worship me. I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. Jesus is thinking in the back of his head, if you only knew, it's all mine. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Everyone here belongs to me. The Father will put all things under my authority. You know, the devil seems to run around. He's got a time. He's got a time. He's got a, a season that he's causing havoc, don't be deceived. Don't fall victim to his house of cards intimidation. He's only like a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion. Jesus is the roaring lion of Judah who will right all wrongs. He's not in charge. Listen, Joel chapter two, verse 28 and 29 says this. Then after doing the, all those things, talking about the end of time, the things that we think, it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse, here's what God says. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men, where are you at? Will dream dreams. Your young men, where are you at? Will see visions. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on servants, men and women alike. See, God, through his Holy Spirit, gives the indication of his empowerment and his authority to all who would believe. And this is in the end days. Guess what? We're living in those days. You have the spirit of God, men and women, old men, young men, servants of the Lord, men and women alike have received the anointing, the calling, the empowerment of God's Holy Spirit. And this is the last days that the Bible promises. This is good. And the hope of the world is still the hope of the world. And it's getting even better because Jesus is getting even closer. Okay, last lie I want to address. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just review this one because we hammer on it every single week. Here's the lie that we're told so often, so loudly, so many times by the world that Christians should keep their faith to themselves. That's a lie. You know what? Just keep it separate. Just like this and that. I, you know, I, I mentioned, I, I feel like I'm, I'm trying to be too cool by mentioning Kanye too many times, but my wife and I did watch one of his services and I was like, dude, that was I have no idea what I just saw, but I, that was powerful. And then I heard that the night before he had gone into a prison and did this uh, amazing, you know, just service and, and praying with people, people accepting Christ, you know, and you're like that, who else needs, who can you think of who needs to be liberated and freed by the truth more than those who are incarcerated as a result of choices of their life? Like, wow, the prisoner needs to be set free. And, and that was what's happening. And then there's the stories about people that are so mad that a Christian service happened in a, in a, a, a government-run facility. Like, that, we should keep that separate. That's what, are you joking me? What's the point? What's the point? The, is the point of prison just to punish people? Or is it to help is it to help people come to a place of seeing themselves and the world differently so that they are changed and transformed by their experience? Is it to, to help give people who are hopeless hope? Is it to, to transform people's visions for themselves and the world around them? Like the gospel belongs behind bars in that capacity. And, and people are upset about it. People say he should just keep it to himself. 
He's, and it's even worse that they let a famous person come in there because since he's famous, people in prison are gonna be more likely to, to listen to him. Well, isn't that just the way God works? I mean, wouldn't the devil just like it if everybody who got their life radically transformed by Jesus, like Kanye, like you, like me, would just shut up and keep it to themselves? That's the lie. Just shut up and keep it to yourself. Yeah, that's nice for little old you. We'll deal with you later with other lies, but just keep it to yourself. We don't want any of this good news spreading. Okay, I'm tired of this lie, and I want to bring some truth. Romans chapter one. We don't even need to look any farther than the first verse, or first chapters of the book of Romans, verse 16 says, for I am not ashamed of the good news. Good news about Christ. It's the power, the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first, hey, there they are again, and also the Gentile. Think about this. Where's the power? It's in the good news of Jesus Christ. Why in the world would we be ashamed of that? Why in the world would we keep that to ourselves? Why would we shut up when we have the hope and power of God alive in us? This, my friends, is worth sharing. This is not just worth sharing, but we are called to share it. We are empowered to share it. We are sent to share the good news. You know what? That's illegal. Really? Really? You're telling me that justice is going to rule out real justice? You're saying that's illegal, or maybe you're trying to twist what, what the law is. I'm just here to say the good news of Jesus Christ. If it's illegal, then I'm Jesse James. <laughs> not the the motorcycle guy, but like the outlaw. Anyway, how about Josie Wales? I'll be Josie Wales, the outlaw Josie Wales for those of you Clint Eastwood fans out there. Man, the power of God. The power of God is in the good news of Jesus Christ. Do not withhold that good from people around you. You know what, you'll be told to shut up. That's okay. I get told to shut up all the time and I just keep going. I've been made a lifelong pursuit. Hey, be quiet. What? I can't hear you. And then I got kicked out of so many classes through the years growing up, just practicing. I'm just practicing, practicing my faith. Okay, it was, I, I needed more practice because I actually got kicked out of junior high Sunday school by Jason Shirley, who was my youth pastor. He kicked me out of Sunday school because I would not shut up. And now, look at me. All right. <laughs> Who's laughing now, Jason? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Oh man, that broke my heart too. I think that was one of those transformational moments in my life. I'm like, oh yeah, he probably should be quiet sometimes. <laughs> but don't be ashamed of the good news of Jesus. Right? I want to close on this verse. And I'll invite our musicians to join me in a moment. Mark 8, 38. If anyone's ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, Whoa. the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with all the holy angels. That's, I mean, that just gets me emotional thinking about that possibility. That that's what we're being told to do. We're being told to willingly put ourselves into a place of hearing Jesus say, I'm ashamed of you. That's a lie. Do not embrace that lie. When you're told to keep your faith to yourself, you just smile and graciously find a new way. Just smile, just be, be kind, be loving, be compassionate, but at all costs, be obedient to the word of Jesus. Friends, if there's one person that you don't want to hear, I'm ashamed of you, it's from Jesus. I know I don't. It would break not only our hearts to think about it, but moreover, it would break his heart. Be proud of the power of the good news. Embrace the power of the good news. Speak the words of God. Look, we've talked about the lies of the battle, about the nature of the enemy, about the power of the good news and the attempts of everyone to silence it who are the enemies of God. These are just a few of the millions and millions and growing number of lies that we're tempted to believe. And my prayer is this, that God would give you eyes to see the truth eyes to see the truth. You know, some of the lies we believe are about ourselves. We look in the mirror, we think things like, not good enough, never gonna be good enough. We think things like, nobody's gonna love me. We think things like, you know, I should just be ashamed of myself. I should just stay home. 
I shouldn't go to church, shouldn't be there. People are gonna judge me, this and that. We think all these kind of things. And God needs to pull back the veil because the truth does what? Sets us free. Who wants to be free today? Free, free, free to run with the authority of God, free to speak the good news that sets prisoners loose from the chains of sin and darkness and death. We just want to pray here. Would you stand with me? Let me ask this question as well. How many of you know right now that you're a prisoner of sin and you're just saying, I know in my life right now that I'm not right with God and I need to, I need to get right with God today. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus or maybe you have and you've been wandering, but you're saying, I need to come to Jesus in a real way and I want him to save me today. Is that you? Could I just, let me just see who, who that is. If you're here, just put a hand up. Amen. I need to get saved. I need to be forgiven. We've, man, what a beautiful moment already at the uh, time of worship of just confessing our sins to the Lord. But I'm just here to say right now, God receives that confession. So Father, right now, once more, we acknowledge that we have fallen short of your glory and we've sinned. We ask for forgiveness in Jesus' name. And we call on Jesus to save us now. Jesus, be our Lord and Savior. Be our Lord and Savior. We thank you for the truth, God. The truth set us free. Set us free. Amen.